Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to a guide where I will be showing you how to build better Midnight Hunt Draft decks. In this video, I'm going to be doing just what the title says, but before I dive in, I want to remind you that if you enjoy it, be sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel for more draft content, and leave a comment in the comment section down below with your questions, thoughts, and feedback. So without further ado, let's get to it. In this guide, I'm going to be talking about the game plan, which is a key part of any deck build, the mana curves that you're going to be wanting to go for in your decks, and then I'm going to be going through the best in class, which are the best cards in Midnight Hunt at the common level at each point along the curve, so you have sort of a litmus test for when you are building your decks on whether you have powerful cards. So, starting things off with the game plan, and we're going to be using a tool called the Traffic Light Model of Game Plan Design. I just came up with this one, but it's a really fun one, so I hope you'll enjoy this little memory tool for the game plan. So the first thing you need to do is stop and think, how will your deck win? So it's a stoplight, it's a red light. You have to think of this before you do anything that has to do with building your deck. You think, how will your deck win? Are you going to be an aggressive deck? Are you going to be a controlling deck? Are you going to be some sort of combo deck, like a mill deck in Limited? How is your deck going to end the game victorious? So stop, ask yourself that question. The next thing you're going to want to do is have that little yellow light moment. It's a warning symbol before you proceed. Do your best cards align with this win condition? If all of your best cards are aggressive two drops and you have decided that your win condition is to win a long, slow, controlling value game, maybe you need to go back to step one and think, how will your deck win again? Because you want to make sure that all of your cards are lining up in the proper manner so that you can use all of your best cards as part of your win condition. And then the final thing as you're going, Right when you hit that green light is what is your one to two sentence mission statement for your deck? So you want to have a clear enough understanding of what your deck is doing before you proceed where you have the ability to explain it to somebody else in one to two sentences. So stop, ask yourself, how will your deck win? Two, double check that your best cards align with this win condition. And three, before you get going, what is your one to two sentence mission statement? Now we're going to walk through an example of this in action. So for this example is a deck that I drafted in the format. It is a three color Abzan deck, green, white, and black. It's got some powerful rares like Liesa, it's got a Cigar to Splendor in there, the Celestis, and then it has some creatures like Eccentric Farmer. It's got relatively good mana fixing. And then overall, this is the snapshot of the deck. We're going to be diving into it in a little bit more depth through these lenses. So the first thing to ask is, how does this deck win? And the simple answer is the deck has some expensive and powerful cards. So casting Liesa is going to win a large number of games where Liesa is played. And then it also has the backup plan of using Diagraph Rebirth to get back Liesa if Liesa dies. And then it just has Rise of the Ants as well, which can single-handedly win a game if the game goes long. And then to facilitate these win conditions, the deck has a lot of self-mill, like Death Bonnet Sprout, which is going to slowly fill the graveyard, and Eccentric Farmer, which is going to fill the graveyard as well and potentially enable the Liesa combo where if you mill the Liesa plus the Diagraph Rebirth, you're able to bring back the Liesa with your Diagraph Rebirth by flashing back the Diagraph Rebirth. So if I mill both of those cards, I can get back my Liesa and win the game with Liesa. So that's another part of my strategy, is I can mill those cards with the Death Bonnet Sprout and the Eccentric Farmer. And then I can also use Can't Stay Away as a way to get back the farmers, get back the sprouts, keep the self-mill going. So I have a clear idea of how the deck wins. Let's go on to step two and do my best cards align with this win condition. And to that, it's a resounding yes. Liesa works very well into this game plan. The whole deck is almost built around Liesa in many ways. And Can't Stay Away is another one of my best cards that also fits perfectly with the strategy that my deck is going for. And the win conditions do align with my best cards. So now let's do a one to two sentence mission statement for this deck. Cast Liesa as often as possible, finding her and bringing her back with self mill and recursion when necessary. If I don't find her, I will grind my opponents out with graveyard value. So... That's the one to two sentence mission statement. My deck has a strategy. It's got a plan. It's ready to go. Let's look right back at the deck for one last time before we continue with the video. And I do want to say that this deck ended up going seven and two, which was a pretty great performance. And I was very happy with how it played out because I had a strong understanding of what the deck was going to be doing before I got into the games. And I just was able to implement that game plan uh, very effectively because I knew what I was doing going in. So Next up, we're going to be talking about mana curves, and the key thing to know is that a good curve is key for all decks. So it doesn't matter if you're a controlling deck or an aggressive deck, you are going to want to have a good curve, and a good curve typically involves having the most plays the cheaper you are. So 
your two drops, you're going to want to have more two drops than three drops, and then more three drops than four drops, and then down to fives and six drops, six drops, which are just lower and lower priority. Now, not every curve is going to be perfect because you're sometimes just going to have more four drops than three drops, or maybe you have a couple good five drops that you really want to play. But in general, you want your curve to look something like a descending scale where you start with your most cards and then you go down. And the reason for this is that two drops are very flexible because you can play them at any point in the game, really. And especially if you uh, are in the early turns, you can do something like on turn four, play two two drops. Whereas on turn two, you can't just say, well, I'll cast half of my four drop. That's just not how four drops work. And the fact is, is that in limited, as with a lot of like almost mana investments, you can think of it as you want to make sure that you're spending your mana earlier because you aren't going to get that mana back. So the earlier you can start spending your mana as efficiently as possible, the more value you're going to be able to get from your cards. And the early stages of the game often dictate the later stages of the game as to who is ahead, who's behind, who's on the front foot, who can leverage their cards more effectively. And so making sure you get off to a good start with those two drops is the key. We're going to go through some mana curve tips. The first one is aim for five to six cards with mana value two or less. Usually these are going to be creatures of some kind, and usually these are going to be two drops because there's not always a ton of one drops running around. Uh, sometimes you can use removal spells instead of creatures in this slot, where if you have a couple of cheap removal spells, you can almost act as if they're creatures because you'll just trade those for your opponent's cheap creatures. So that is a good little starting point to aim for. Aggressive decks are going to want to have six to seven two drops, and the more defensive decks can maybe get away with four sometimes, but you're usually going to want to have five to six cards with mana value two or less in every single deck that you draft. The next tip is that the three and four drop slots tend to fill themselves, so you really don't have to prioritize or deprioritize three and four drops. You can actually sometimes, I guess you can deprioritize them sometimes because you're generally going to get them. Uh, at some point in the draft, you're going to have a couple threes and fours that you want to put into your deck. Those are the slots that tend to fill themselves the most, and you don't really need to say, well, I need a three drop here really badly, so I'm going to take this card. Usually you can just not really worry about it. As long as you've got your two drops sorted, you're going to have the rest. The threes and fours are going to kind of figure themselves out. And then the final tip here for mana curves is be selective with your expensive cards that cost five or more mana. Those cards are not going to come down early in the game. They need to have a real impact when you do cast them so that they can justify the fact that they are kind of inflexible on when you can cast them. And you just can't have too many of these. That's why a lot of the time, it's nice to take cheaper cards early because then when you do see a really good five drop, you have the space in your mana curve to take it. So let's look at some more powerful decks. First, going back to the deck that I showed earlier as a good example, there are seven relevant plays, really six because you're not really counting, can't stay away, but there are six plays to have before, but on turns one and two with the death bonnet sprouts being included and then can't stay away is more of a late game card. So you've got about six early plays, we are including the Olivia's Midnight Ambush and the Foul Play in that equation. And then as you can see, there is only one card that costs six mana. There's a few cards that cost five mana, but there's a pretty high bar that has to be cleared there. Liesa is one of them. The Diagraph Rebirth is one of them. And then there's just a couple of other cards there at that five drop slot. And then the threes and fours kind of fill themselves out. Now, when you are constructing your curve, when you a lot of the times you'll want to separate your creatures from your removal spells if they are not early game removal spells. So with, for example, with Clear Shot, which you can see in the three drop slot, I have two copies of that hidden right behind the Celestis. You aren't necessarily going to want to count that as a three drop because if I only had Clear Shots in the three drop slot, I would not be developing my board at all on turn three. So essentially, when you are counting your cards, you want to make sure that's a card that you are going to cast on that turn. So for example, Foul Play or Olivia's Midnight Ambush, I could totally see myself casting that on turn two to kill my opponent's two drop if I needed to. Whereas these other, some of these other cards like clear shot you really want to find a better opportunity to use that clear shot later on so make sure that your cards actually are things you're going to want to cast at that point on the curve a card like celestis can count as a three drop because if i have that in my opening hand and on on turn three i would be totally willing to cast that to develop my mana and things like that Another example of a deck, this deck was very effective as well. It also got to maximum wins. It went 7-0, and oh, and as you can see, it really overloads that two-drop slot. Now, Might of the Old Ways is a combat trick. You can kind of see that hidden behind the Startle. Startle and Might of the Old Ways are both combat tricks, so those aren't really counting as two-drops per se. So that means I have like eight two-drop creatures, essentially, and then I have those four combat tricks, which I don't really count as two-drops. And then you can just see very nice curve. I go down the curve, five three-drops, 
four four drops and then a couple of cards at the expense event you notice i don't have any five drops that doesn't really matter because the fives and sixes just have a high bar to clear before they're worth playing and phantom carriage and rise of the ants are both very good cards that clear that bar so you can see descending curve this deck was very very effective and won a lot of games i mean it won maximum games and had no losses it was just a very efficient deck Moving on to another example of a deck, this one went 7 and 2. It's very effective as well. You can see a lot of cards the 2-drop slot. The 3s and 4s don't really matter as much to me. There's a few 4-drops extra, but that's because I've got very powerful ones like Organ Hoarder and Shadow Beast Sighting. In the 2-drop slot, again, make sure you check the cards. Locked in the Cemetery, Might of the Old Ways, Startle, Duel for Dominance aren't really cards that are getting cast in the early game, but I still have 5 2-drop creatures, and then I have the... Uh, one death bonnet sprout so i have about six proactive plays to play in the early stages of the game and then i have my curve sorted again look at the top end of the curve not a ton of expensive cards and in midnight hunt specifically it's even less of a priority to have expensive cards because of things like flashback that are going to give you stuff to do with your cards later in the game flashback and disturb really give you some good mana sinks at the expensive end of the curve so this deck went seven and two it was very effective and by the way if you want to see the draft videos for any of those three decks if you want to see me drafting them playing them explaining all my thought processes you can find those on my channel i've got them all uploaded already and uh, you can watch those videos if you're interested in seeing my thought processes like play-by-play -play live for those decks. So now we're going to be going through the best in class section. This is the best common creatures at each spot on the curve in Midnight Hunt Draft. So these are the sorts of cards that you can kind of measure your cards against when you're building your deck. You can say, well, these are the two drops I'm considering running. How do they line up with the best of the best in the set? And that can sometimes inform you on whether or not to run a marginal three drop or something of that nature. You can be like, well, this card's not really up to snuff in the format, for example. So at the one drop slot, there's some very good one drops in the set, which isn't always the case. But here we've got Gavney Trapper, Ecstatic Awakener, and Lunark Veteran, all very powerful plays to do on turn one. And uh, they scale relatively nicely into the game as well. Some good two drops to be aware of. And these, these aren't always going to be every single good card at that slot on the curve. But these are just some general baselines to be evaluating your cards at when you're building your decks and things like that. So these are the sorts of things. This is a video on building a good deck after all. So knowing which cards feature in good decks. You probably saw a lot of the same cards spread out across the two blue-green decks that I have had showed earlier because... A lot of those cards are very powerful and contribute to getting good wins. But here, Siege Zombie is very good, especially if you can get a lot of Decayed Tokens. Candle Grove Witch gets some nice evasive power and can be a good part of the white aggro decks. And then Bait Hook Angler is a great blue two drop that can come back with Disturb, works well with Self Mill and all of that. Moving on to some three drops, we've got Falcon Abomination. Getting two bodies for one card can be really nice, even if one of them is a Decayed Token. A lot of blue decks have good ways to use the Decayed Token. Eccentric Farmer has been a great performer, fueling mill self-mill synergies and also getting some nice value by getting a land back. And then Morning Patrol is a just pretty solid three drop that can get you a nice value with Disturb and uh, overall just a pretty solid, rock-solid card, as they say. Moving on to the four drops, I did want to note with cards like like organ hoarders is a fantastic four drop it just blows the other ones away but i wanted to sh like talk about shadow be sighting a little bit specifically because it's a sorcery so you might th not think of it as a creature especially on mtg arena you can sometimes click to see how many creatures you have in your deck and when i was talking about cards that you want to play at a specific point on the curve if it is a card that generates a token like shadow beast sighting you can consider that as part of your curve just because a card is an instant or a sorcery does not mean that it can't count into your mana curve uh, so i just wanted to make that note shadow beast sighting a very powerful four drop and then search party captains almost cheating at a, as a four drop because it can often be cast for three or even less but it is a very good four drop as well there's also a couple of four drops that i didn't mention here clarion cathars gavany silversmith are both great white four drops but i wanted to show off some of these cards as uh and specifically the shadow be sighting to bring up that x that point but there's a good there's a lot of good four drops in this set and so one thing you'll notice is that if there's a lot of good four drops, you can sometimes have to deprioritize each and every one of them because you'll end up with some of them naturally just over the course of the draft. You'll see four drops and unlike two drops where you can have like six or seven or even eight in the case of the deck I showed earlier with four drops, you really don't want to have too many because again, you can't cast half of a four drop on turn two or turn three. And then moving on to the five drops, the only five drop that matters in the format is Diagraph Horde. <laughs> this is 
kind of a joke, but not really because this card is just an absolute beating and it's really the only five drop at common that you care about. But just for the sake of completion, there are a couple of other five drops that are solid. Drowner and Amalgam can just be a nice top end blocker for your zombie decks, fuel your mills, like self mill sh shenanigans a little bit and then peck in for some damage. And Soul Guide Grift can be annoying exiling your opponent's cards and also being a flyer that can chip in but <laughs> diagraph horde is really the five drop of choice in the format just if you're thinking best in class five drops diagraph horde is just absolutely a massacre just even compared to these other five drops it's just yeah very good and then there's not even any common six drops or higher in the set probably because there's a lot of ways to spend your mana as well but there are no six drops or higher in the set that are common creatures so we don't even have to look at any of those more expensive cards but yeah that is going to do it for this video i really do hope you enjoyed it if you did remember to hit that thumbs up button subscribe to the channel for more draft content uh, be sure to check out those midnight hunt draft videos of the decks that i showed off earlier on as examples if you want to see more into my thought process while i was actually building them and be sure to comment below if you have any questions or feedback and to let me know you made it all the way to the end of the video leave hashtag building codes because just like when you're constructing a building and have certain building codes to follow when you're building a draft deck there are also certain rules to follow and hopefully after watching this video you understand some of those a little bit better anyway that is going to do it for this video i really do hope you enjoyed it and found it helpful but that, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and I will talk to you next time.